Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided, this threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy and other Egan Community Television programming is supported by Thomson Reuters, makers of Westlaw Next and based in Egan. Through Westlaw Next and other innovative online services, Thomson Reuters is the world's leading source of intelligent information for businesses and professionals. Online at ThomsonReuters.com and by U.S. Federal Credit Union, the member-owned financial institution offering service, value, and experience you can trust to the greater Twin Cities community. Welcome. Access to Democracy returns, a first-time guest, but not the organization that he represents. Council Alberto Fierro is the Consul of Mexico here in Minnesota, and welcome. Thanks so much for inviting me. Oh, it's our pleasure. And uh, Nathan Wolf, who preceded you several years back, had, had previously guested on the show, Happy to have him. What people don't realize is the size of the Mexican population in Minnesota. I mean, it's not just dozens of people, it is... Well, according to the census, the last census, there's around uh, 180,000 Mexicans in, in Minnesota, mostly in the uh, Twin Cities metropolitan area, but also in the southern uh, cities of Minnesota. Now, you came to Mexico on a visit 20 years ago, and you liked the weather so much you asked to be posted here, is that correct? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I loved the cities, and I loved how progressive the state is, and I, I knew a lot about, uh, about Minnesota, so when I knew that the position was going to be open, I raised my hand to be here, yes. And uh, a consul position lasts from between two to six years in, in a location, and then they move you to another location. Is that exactly. how it works? Exactly. I, I am a career diplomat, so I follow orders, and after here, I will be posted somewhere else. So let's follow your career mm -hmm. a little bit as to where you started and where you've been. Okay. Well, I joined <coughs> the foreign ministry at mid-career. I had been a cultural promoter at the public library system in Mexico, traveling throughout the country, opening new public libraries. But I always wanted and dreamed of being able to showcase Mexico abroad. Because if something, if in one area Mexico is very, very important, as you know very well, is in culture and so I, my dream was to be a cultural attaché in, for Mexico abroad. So after several years in, in the cultural ministry in Mexico, I applied to join the foreign ministry. And I was sent to Washington. And that was my, my first position as a deputy cultural attaché at the Mexican Interesting embassy. Interesting place to yes. be sent. Wonderful. Yeah. I never imagined that that would be my first. It's the most important embassy of Mexico. So having it as my first posting, it was just splendid. And from Washington? To Ottawa, the capital <coughs> of Canada. I was cultural attaché there too, so had the privilege of showcasing splendid Mexican art and culture and tradition. Ottawa was a Canadians. great city. Uh, did you ever go skating in the canals uh, in the winter? Yes, you did. I, I did it very, very much. What I don't do is ski, but but I do skate and I love uh, snowshoeing. So. Uh, my introduction to the winter was Ottawa precisely, and I'm, I'm not afraid of it. I enjoy it very much. And from Ottawa? I went back to Mexico, and I was first director for uh, U.S. and Canada at the Foreign Ministry. 
and then I went to be director general for international affairs at the Ministry of Culture. So I traveled throughout the world promoting Mexican culture and then went back to the foreign ministry to be the head of culture and education for three years. But all Mexican diplomats must serve always in, in a consulate in order to continue going up the ladder in the uh, diplomatic career. And I had never been in a consulate. So I was sent uh, to Orlando for three years in Florida and covered the uh, central, uh, central and northern Florida. And after three years, I was ready to come here. It's interesting because I just dropped friends off at the airport this morning who were on their way to Orlando. Mm -hmm. Not one of my favorite cities, but uh, that's, you know. Uh, in, in that part of Florida, there's 600,000 Mexicans, so that kept me very busy. I would think so. And I didn't go much to the parks. I, I was working, giving services to the Mexicans. Yes. And then to here. Yes. And mm -hmm. you're here now two and a half years. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. And as, as we discussed before we went on, uh, Mexico is a very special place to Sharon and myself. And we have vacationed in Puerto Vallarta now for 16, 17 years. And love it, love it. I love the people, I love the location, uh, I love the food. I, I just love everything about it. It would be if I ever retired completely it would be the place i would retire well, that's to great. Right? Puerto Vallarta mm. and safe let's talk about because the reaction i get from friends is that oh mexico don't you feel nervous about walking the streets etc no mm -hmm. 16 years 17 years we walk day we walk night we walk to restaurants we walk back uh, perfectly safe. There are some spots in Mexico, as there are in the United States, where the State Department issues warnings. Mm -hmm. Puerto Vallarta is certainly not one of them. Uh, as Cancun is not one one. Mm -hmm. uh, Cozumel, uh, Playa del Carmen, uh, the Baja Peninsula, uh, wonderful places, wonderful people, perfectly safe. Yeah, well, your knowledge of Mexico and, and resorts and places is, is incredible. And, it, and it's true, the, the, uh, Mexico's a big country, so making a generalization is always uh, troubling. Uh, the State Department has started to issue very, very specific travel alerts. At th in 2010, the first one was very broad and harsh. But then, precisely, we, uh, my ministry worked with the State Department saying we have to show those travel alerts should show the reality. So mm -hmm. it's true that Yucatan Peninsula, the whole peninsula is very safe. Mexico City, that many people would think uh, because it's so big that it's unsafe, it's as safe as any big city. Uh, the northern part of the uh, cities of, of Mexico in uh, Querétaro, in Aguascalientes, where 3M, uh, in San Luis Potosí, where 3M has a, a big plant, it's pretty safe. So yes, there are some set areas where there has been conflicts uh, in the war against drugs. Uh, but for example, Ciudad Juarez that you were mentioning, uh, five years ago I Detroit. would say don't go. And Baltimore. today it's wonderful. Yeah, it's I true. mean, you mm -hmm. know, our places where we, we are having a lot of problems mm -hmm. at the present time. But again, not here yeah. and certainly not in the places yeah. that we have visited. And uh, it's such a flavor. Uh, at Vellus last year, uh, there was a band in one of the restaurants and we struck up a friendship with them. And somehow or other, I mentioned that I used to play drums in a dance band back in high school mm -hmm. and college. They invited me up to play a set. Mm -hmm. I almost put them out of business, I think. <laughs> I hadn't had drumsticks in my hands for decades. Mm -hmm. They were so nice. And we took some pictures and uh, we call that my band. But mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah, well, uh, I typical. suppose that that's why more than a million Americans live in Mexico. It's the biggest expatriate community uh, yeah. um, outside of the U.S. And uh, they have seen that it's safe, that there's good medical services, the food is, is nice, and most importantly, people uh, like Americans, Mexicans like uh, working, serving, uh, becoming friends with Americans. And they do a wonderful job. Yes. Bucerios has a wonderful uh, Sunday, really bizarre, I guess you would call it, farmer's market, whatever. Mm -hmm. And if anybody is going to Mexico and is in that area, go to Bucerios anytime after 10 o'clock Sunday morning, mm. and you will just be, you will absolutely be astounded. Anything that you possibly want, from food, uh, to fish, to meats, to all sorts of artifacts and uh, really bling, uh, of, of different types, uh, jewelry, etc. At this wonderful market, and it takes yeah. about an hour and a half to walk the entire thing. Restaurants, wonderful. Yeah. Do you know that just with one airline that flies from here, from uh, Minneapolis to different beaches, more than 80,000 Minnesotans visit Mexico every year? Yeah. Sun Country. So, yeah. That's, that's yeah. the one we yeah. take. Okay. <laughs> I didn't uh, know we, if we could mention it here. No, so we could mention yes. it. Actually, yeah. Delta flies there also. Yeah. So that, that's why I think and if uh, just some country takes 80,000, maybe there's around 200,000 Minnesotans yeah. visiting Mexico. And the nice part about it is it's a direct flight, mm -hmm. and it's about three and a half, four hours. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it's really a comfortable direct flight. Yeah. and. Uh, and it seems that very soon, at least in Cancun, it's going to be like Canadian airports that uh, uh, Americans will be able to pass migration uh, bef in Cancun before coming uh, to the U.S. Oh. And we hope that in, in the future, in the next five days, it will start happening in most of the resorts. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there is a spot in Mexico that's inhabited by many uh, Americans who have retired there. So I'm, I can't think of the name of it San all. Miguel Allende. Yeah, San Miguel, yeah. yeah. It, it's like three hours and a half north of Mexico City. It's a beautiful colonial town. It's a small town, but it's 40 minutes away from the capital of the state of Guanajuato, a splendid uh, mining town. And yes, San Miguel um, is the, the biggest, probably, uh, town where Americans live. There's more Americans mm. than Mexicans there. I'm, I, I, I'm not sure if there are more, <laughs> but at least 50-50, yes. yes. Mm. And uh, places to tour. Uh, an agave plant. I didn't know what agave was years mm -hmm. ago. But uh, yeah, and well, as you know, tequila is made of blue agave. Uh, mezcal is made of the, all the other types yeah. of uh, of agaves. For example, visiting Guadalajara, uh, the tequila region is uh, in a couple miles uh, outside of Guadalajara, the second biggest city in in Mexico and you can take a tourist train and visit all the 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 uh, the places where tequila is made and you can try uh, in the each factories, of the places the plants, and yeah. it's a very very nice we have done one that. day tour yes not recommended when you're driving we usually rent a car and I drive. If you take the train then yeah, you know, someone is driving <coughs> for you yes. that's another thing friends have said you drive in Mexico? Yes, I drive in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, here we are, years later. It, uh, it's the misconceptions that are troubling. Uh, mm -hmm. The reality is a pleasure. Yeah. And, and it's, it's true, unfortunately uh, for Mexico, we're probably one of the countries with the worst press in the US. Because usually what you hear is the bad news and not not necessarily the good news, right. uh, but our economy is so tight, 
tied up with the, with the U.S. For example, we are one of the most important car exporters in, in the world. And of the cars that we export to the U.S. made in Mexico, more than 40% of that car is made in the U.S. So it tells you how our economies, like our societies, are now so interrelated. Well, there used to be, uh, people say, uh, Mexicans keep coming into the United States, sneaking across the border. The fact of the matter is, in the last two years, there have been more Mexicans who have returned to Mexico yeah, because yeah. of the growth of your economy yeah. than have been coming into this country, yeah. notwithstanding uh, morons like Donald Trump, and I yeah. won't say anything more than that, but uh, uh, with misinformation. The fact of the matter is your economy is really, really taken off and it's great for not only Mexico but for the US. Yeah, and it's part of the North American economy with Canada, US and, and Mexico. If a lot of Mexicans came after we signed NAFTA in the 90s, it was because the boom of the US economy uh, needed those people. Uh, and they came because they knew that they would do five times better than in Mexico because still the dif differential of salaries between Mexico and the U.S. is still big. But Mexico offers uh, people to stay with their families, continue with their families, that as you know, it's a very, very important thing for, for a Mexican. And it gives another opportunities, not only that. But do you know that how much the 80,000 Mexicans, because if there's around 180,000 Mexicans in, in the state, 80,000 of them are the full workers in, in the economy. But they're paying taxes here. They pay more than Absolutely. 500 million taxes every year. Absolutely. No. And uh, very important. And also, Minnesota is a big trading partner with Mexico. Yeah, I we think that we're the second trading partner. We used to be the third after Canada and China and since last year we became the second trading partner. There's four billion dollars to two billion on, 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 on each side so it is very important and that's why we were so glad that Governor Dayton uh, took a mission this year to to Mexico City and Guadalajara precisely uh, recognizing how important the relationship between Mexico and Minnesota is. And I mentioned to you Ramon Ruiz, who is the proprietor of Andiamo, which is a wonderful restaurant here in Egan. He's been on the show a few times, mm -hmm. and uh, we've actually entertained him at, at home with his wife, and uh, he describes me as his brother from another mother. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, We've gotten very close, a wonderful, wonderful human being, and took a, a restaurant a location that had failed twice and has turned it into really a booming success. And, uh, and a bunch of Mexican restaurants are also springing up yeah, uh, and, in this and area. And it's incredible, and I, I'm very happy <coughs> to s be able to see now how many of those Mexicans that came looking for the American dream are reaching it. For example, there's uh, uh, the owner of Tamales La, Rom La Loma. He started uh, 15, 20 years ago selling some tamales at Mercado Central in Bloomington and Lake. And now he's selling throughout the state, trying to, to start going to the whole country and makes more than a million and a half tamales per year. So. And that's a lot of tamales. It's, it's <laughs> a lot, a lot of tamales. And that tells you also something that I'm sure that 30 years ago in Minnesota, um, there was one good r Mexican restaurant in 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 St. Paul, in in the west side of, of St. Paul. But now it's Look incredible around, how many right here in Egan there yeah. are three or four right yeah. now in yeah. Egan. Yes. And so more Mexicans eat. I remember when McDonald's was going to open in Mexico, people were worried that we would stop eating tacos. And no, we, we eat McDonald's and tacos, and <laughs> Americans eat that too. Yeah, yeah, we're North American community. Now, I know education and culture and the arts have been very important to you. Mm -hmm. And you have developed a relationship 
with the uh, Minsku, Minnesota State Colleges mm -hmm. and Universities. Let's talk about that a little yeah. bit. I, I know you've encouraged a lot of people to get their associate degrees. Yeah. Well, we believe that mm -hmm. education is fundamental for the well-being of, of, of families. With the DREAM Act that was passed in Minnesota two years ago, that is changing the scope of Mexican families here. Because if before going to, to a university, they would have to pay international tuition uh, as international students, now Mexican youngsters can get their deferred action card, get a working permit, get a li driver's license, and have access to grants to pursue higher education. I, so we, we've been working very closely with men's Q institutions. They have now in many of them Latino coordinators inviting uh, uh, th those kids to join uh, the universities. That's the workforce of the future for the state. As you know, the, uh, the future uh, of growth in demographics in Minnesota will come from people, as they call it here, of color. I've, mm, uh, and Latinos and Mexicans are, are part of that. But also, President Obama and President Peña Nieto launched two years ago uh, the new U.S.-Mexico agenda, and one of them, is one of the most important programs, is the bilateral forum on higher education, innovation, and exchange. Because it's, the idea it's as important for young Mexicans as it is for Americans. Yeah. And, and as a matter of fact, there are a lot of Americans who are also students in Mexico, as well as Mexican students uh, yeah. who were here in our schools. Yeah. There's not enough, and that's why they launched this program, because it doesn't reflect how, uh, how connected our economies are. Uh, the numbers uh, of, st of students in uh, the other country is still slow, but precisely there are new programs, and this year several Mexican universities visited uh, Mensque institutions, and I was yesterday at Mensque precisely uh, and heard that again in March, and Mexicans don't mind coming in March, uh, uh, the Association of Universities of Mexico will be sending an important delegation precisely to see how can we work together. For example, I mentioned, or I can say Medtronic is huge in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And in Tijuana, in nor northern bo border uh, with the, the U.S., uh, they, they are thinking in exchanging between the Technological Institute there and St. Cloud University here, students uh, of both places that will work in, in Medtronic plants. So there is a lot more to do and that is part of the future of the North American labor and North American community. And uh, again, uh, language is no problem because almost everybody in Mexico speaks a lot better English than I do Spanish and uh, struggle with it. I know to ask for the bathroom. I know uh, baños, mm -hmm. uh, la cuenta, uh, at the end of a uh, meal in a restaurant for the bill, but very limited. But Mexicans are not limited in English. Uh, obviously, they start in school at a young age. Yeah. And it has become uh, an absolute <coughs> priority to uh, teach better English in, in Mexico. So there was some resistance, but uh, just uh, the last two years, uh, an enormous group of engineer students and students uh, in universities have been coming with grants for four week intensive course of English precisely because we know that without English we cannot be a full partner of the US and Canada as part of NAFTA. And the people mm -hmm. in Europe feel the same way mm -hmm. also in those mm -hmm. individual countries. Yeah. Now a typical day uh, in the consulate uh, here could involve what? We have people lining up outside to come in. 
what might they be looking for that you can yeah. do for them? Yeah, we, we get around between 70 and 100 people per day. In between, in Feb between February and March, it was twice as much people because they need their new passports or their first passport or their m consular ID. And uh, February and March is the biggest because they want to have it so they can pay taxes. Uh, so they go for, uh, for an ID. Now they can get their birth certificates in order to have it, they don't have to ask for it in Mexico. Anyone that needs to do a legal uh, action in Mexico, getting divorced, selling a, a, a property, opening, uh, closing a bank account, they, they need to give a power of attorney to a third person. So as a consul, I am the one that signs the, the power of attorneys. We give dual citizenship to the children of Mexicans born here, so they come and register them so they can have both nationalities. We have a legal and protection area that gives them aid and assistance in case of vulnerability or if they are victims of domestic violence or of, of a crime, we send them to lawyers and, and give them uh, assistance. We also have a wonderful health booth with St. Mary's Clinic where we give a lot of information on, of how, to the families of how to take care, uh, but we measure cholesterol, sugar, there's a lot of diabetes unfortunately amongst Mexicans, and mm -hmm. so we work with St. Mary's. The rich foods uh, is yeah. what does it, yeah. Uh, uh, so we work with St. Mary's in referring to clinics of low cost. And since a year ago, we have an educational booth to help Mexican families here understand that in the U.S. they are uh, expected to be a lot more active in the education of their kids, not as in Mexico, that they just give the responsibility to teachers. So we help them navigate the system and here they have to shop better for higher education and so we have one person in, in, or, in, in that visits the school districts, that visits uh, the uh, community colleges and tries to help and families. How big is your staff? We are 20 people now, yes. And uh, obviously kept very busy and uh, it's wonderful. Well, yeah. <coughs> and I try to promote tourism, promote and increase trade and do, as we have mentioned, uh, links of collaboration in higher education and culture. Well, mm -hmm. in my case, it's only a matter of weeks before we will be returning to Puerto Vallarta mm -hmm. and uh, I look forward to it. But you have to come and be my guest at Andiamo restaurant one I'd of these days. I'd love to, yes, thank you so much. Ramon yes. would mm -hmm. love to, uh, you'll recognize him because mm -hmm. I know his family has already been to the consulate. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking with Alberto Fierro, the consul of Mexico here in St. Paul, Access to Democracy. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me.